level seven we are back with another edition of the agents of fandom podcast and you know i may sound kind of sleepy because i am it's been a long week we've done a lot of content but i'm sure i'm gonna perk back up as soon as we start talking about all the goodness we have coming on this episode because we got a lot of news we're gonna talk some she hulk we're gonna talk some andor and uh, we're going to have the good classic banter you are all here for. But I am joined, as always, by my co-host, Garrett Blaney. Garrett, how are you doing? You know, I am hurting for a yurtin'. That is how I'm <laughs> doing today. Hurting for a yurtin'. I, I'm hurting for a yurtin', too. We had some group therapy on the Ticket to Reality podcast earlier, and now all I'm missing is a little yurtin'. I feel you. But we have a special guest as well. The Yurton's going to have to wait. We are joined by our friend from Streamer News, Rob. How you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, I just got off work a little bit ago. I'm a little tired. A little tired. It has been a very, very big week. Um, but I'm ready to go. I'm ready to Yurton. No, not right. <laughs> not the right thing. Yeah. yeah, you know, we'll, you're, you're going to... You're going to ride the yurt sweat wave, and uh, we're going to flow through this episode together, and it's going to be real nice for everyone. Oh, yeah. And so the first bit of news we're going to flow through quickly, but before we get to that, if you're watching this in video form, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe on YouTube, uh, give us a five-star rating and review on uh, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure you are subscribed. And check out agentsoffandom.com. We have some real great pieces right now. We have a bunch of interviews from my time at the Edmonton Expo. We have some reviews of House of the Dragon, Hocus Pocus 2, and a lot of really great things up there. So make sure you head there as well and click the Agents of Fandom store and grab yourself a shirt while you are at it. We also have a cool uh, cosplay video review up on YouTube. Exactly. Head over to YouTube for our Hocus Pocus 2 review in full cosplay by uh, our friend and new agent, Jamie Smile Cosplay. So make sure you check that out as well. But we got so much news to talk about. We don't have time to spend too much on the plugs and things like that. We got to dive right into it. So the first bit, I'm going to kind of rifle through a little bit. Kevin Feige had an interview. Elizabeth Olsen had an interview. They both talked about wanting the Scarlet Witch back in business as soon as possible. That's great. We love Lizzie. We love Wanda. We want to see it happen. Wakanda Forever uh, had a feature in Empire Magazine. A lot of first look photos. Everyone looks incredible, especially Namor. He looks so damn cool. I'm very excited for this movie. If you got a chance uh, to watch that uh, trailer on the big screen, it's absolutely incredible. I definitely recommend that because it is something special and uh, we're looking forward to that movie. Apparently, we can expect a Quantumania trailer uh, at the beginning of fall, so that should be coming within the next few weeks. What else do we got here? We got Harrison Ford apparently was looked at for the role and Marvel was interested in him for the role of Thunderbolt Ross, having him be recasted in that spot. Um, I've heard from a few people that he already said no, and that's not a thing that's going to happen. But this is all rumors at this point, so we never really know. Um, I wouldn't really want that anyways, to be honest with you, if you're like, there's other ways to go about this. Yeah, I'm with you too. I feel like that wouldn't be a lot of weird, but we got two... Yeah. Big ones. And so we're going to touch on our last small-ish one, which would be huge on any other week. But on this week, it's kind of small. And that is Blade losing their director. Apparently, the script is going to be completely rewritten. And the person who wrote the uh, script and is going to be leading the charge... or Sorry, the person who's going to be leading the charge on the rewrites is the same writer as X-Men 97... So we got a lot of interesting Marvel stuff, and uh, Garrett, I'll throw it to you first if there's any specific one you want to touch on, um, maybe uh, looking at uh, that Blade one in particular. Yeah, just uh, real quick about the WandaVision stuff that, like Thanos, was inevitable, and then moving on to the Bassam Tariq uh, Blade situation, yeah, that's... That's tough to hear, you know. Um, it, that came with kind of a lot of news that not only was um, the script supposedly not that great and not a lot of people were happy with it. Um, supposedly Mahershala Ali and Bassam Tariq 
are had some differences and unfollowed each other on Instagram and stuff like that. But I think the one of the most important pieces out of that was that uh, Kevin Feige is spread a little bit too thin, and I think that's understandable with how much shit that we've that has been released or announced this year. I mean, I think it makes sense. And then uh, you have such a strict timeline that you that you've set up for yourself that now when something like this happens and it sets you back like so far we we already saw you know kind of that happen with wandavision how it was supposed to be uh it wasn't supposed to be the first series that was released um and then it ended up being the first series that re- that was released which ended up changing america chavez being in no way home to being a multiverse of madness so there's a lot of stuff that comes with a delay like this and uh it's tough to see uh you know tough to see not what you want to see but i'll obviously i have faith in in marvel to to bring it back but i weirdly enough like i don't have a lot of concern because i kind of feel like if they're making changes it's going to be working out for the best we lost rob in video form uh rob are you still with us for audio yeah i'm i'm still with you i can see my cam and the lights on so Perfect. It might be something that we just can't see you and it'll uh, be something Ruben can pop up back when, when this gets in video form. So we won't worry about it. But um, what do you think about uh, all this news that has dropped? Is there any that particularly caught your eye before we dive into the two extra big ones uh, in particular? Yeah, definitely uh, the Blade news. That that really, really shocked me because it kind of just came out of nowhere because it seemed like we were finally getting to that point where it's like, all right, we're, we're getting the, we're getting the ball rolling here. And then it's just another delay on top of it. Um, it's really sad to hear um, about maybe some of the stuff that was going on with the script and such uh, props to Bo DeMeo. Uh, he been on a, like, he's been on a tangent lately. Like he, he did Moon Knight doing X-Men 97. Now it's seeming like he's going to be rewriting the entire Blade script, which is going to be a very big movie. Uh, for many people, uh, the delays will happen. They're always inevitable, especially with a big company like Marvel Studios. And when it comes to the timeline and stuff and having to switch things up in the script because of the timeline, I personally wouldn't expect too much of the of, of changes being made for timeline purposes because other than the supernatural side of the MCU, I see Blade really setting up and and diving into um i can't see many like universe multiverse saga wide things they would need to uh really uh change upon but yeah that that one that one really really shocked me yeah it kind of came out of left field a little bit mm -hmm. yeah and then i guess to tj do you have anything you want to say about it before because the last thing i want to say about it is going to lead into the other news um it's not necessarily my belief. It is just kind of me stirring the pot a little bit. But that news was released uh, at nighttime on the same night that we got the Deadpool 3 Hugh Jackman returning as Wolverine yeah. news. Um, so that came out. Ryan Reynolds dropped that on, t- Ryan Reynolds dropped that on Twitter in the morning. Um, we all freaked out or it was kind of in the afternoon. Maybe we all, everyone freaked out. Twitter broke, uh, later that night we got the blade news. And then the next morning they released another video, uh, with more Hugh Jackman kind of further explaining stuff. And it sandwiched that blade news, which kind of softened the blow for us. So I'm not saying that I believe this, but, uh, it's definitely possible that that was all timed out to soften the news of that blade uh basam Tariq dropout or it could have been because when i chatted with david Hayter at the edmonton expo who of course is the writer of 2000s x-men film he said <laughs> at the soon as the day was over he was going to be emailing kevin feige because they had an interview together a meeting at the beginning of the pandemic to talk about the future and he was going to follow up on that and now all of a sudden we got Wolverine in the MCU. So maybe he's going to be popping back uh, as part of some attachment. You can find that full interview on our YouTube and agentsoffandom.com. But in a new week of uh, huge news, this is the biggest news of the week. 
Rob, what went through your brain when you found out that uh, Wolverine was going to be Hugh Jackman was going to be coming back as Wolverine in Deadpool three. All right. So a little bit of quick backstory here. I started reading comics because when I was like two or three years old, I was obsessed with the X-Men movies. Um, and Hugh Jackman was my dude. So I, <laughs> the other day I'm playing Fortnite. Okay. I'm having a good time. Our good friend Mo calls me. He's like, I need you to go to Twitter right now. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? He's like, dude, look at Twitter right now. I was like, okay. So I go to Twitter and the first thing I see is our streamer news tweet. Deadpool 3 has been announced with Hugh Jackman turning as Wolverine. And I lost my mind. Like this was, for me, this is bigger than like Toby and Andrew. This is, I, I couldn't imagine. Like we all know they've been joking about Hugh and Wolverine in the first two Deadpool movies because of the meta Ryan Reynolds and him and all that good stuff. But they're actually doing it. Like this is a, it doesn't feel real to me still that in two years we're going to be getting a Deadpool and Wolverine buddy movie, and I, I, I it's unspeakable. I don't know. Yeah. So Rob, I want to get your take on this first in terms of plot. What do you think is going to be coming? My favorite uh, ongoing theory is the Wolverine or sorry the Deadpool kills the Fox first. Um, and my personal take on it that I think would be fantastic would be if it's not just he goes in and he's fighting a bunch of the X-Men. Uh, he's timeline hopping because we, we remember how Deadpool 2 ended, right? Him going back in time to uh, kill the mouth uh, sewn shut version, which was the coolest caption ever for him to uh, uh, put on that post there. But I think it'd be really cool if, he just is taking, goes through the Fox universes. We don't just get one Hugh Jackman Wolverine. We get a bunch of Hugh Jackman Wolverines uh, from each of the different timelines. And the final one he gets to uh, is the Logan timeline. And he goes and he already sees that he was dead. And then Laura Kenny just absolutely fucking kicks Deadpool's ass. I think that would be really, really cool. And what I like about that idea is it sets the stage for kind of one of two things either a full-on mutant X-Men reboot in the MCU, and they could be real meta about the whole thing, jokes th uh, throughout that th uh, along the way. And it could leave us with either a total reboot or Hugh Jackman just continuing in the role, and he is old man Logan in the MCU, um, and uh, Laura Kinney is the Wolverine in, in the MCU going forward. So, Rob, I want to know, one, what, is, uh, what do you think of my theories? And two, what is uh, what would you like to see out of this movie, kind of plot wise? I I really love that theory. Um, it, it's very similar to what mine is. Uh, mine is is I think it's going to be a multiverse movie, um, and I think it's going to be, I think it will be a buddy movie with him and Fox Hugh Jackman Wolverine, the one that we've seen all these years. I think he's going to pluck him out of wherever Wolverine is in at. In, in the time period that the Deadpool movies take place. They're, he's going to pluck them out and they're going to go on like Can a Can I interject quick with, yeah. I dropped this on the Lights Thunder, uh, the Lights Thunder Action Podcast with uh, Thomas uh, Carter Rochester and uh, uh, John Ross Bradford from the direct. And my theory kind of with uh, where I think a perfect place to pluck him from would be is right after Days of Future Past. Right yes, when that's exactly where I was happy. Thinking. Yeah, he's happy. Everything's reset. He thinks it's all good. And then Deadpool pulls him right out of there and ruins his life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, because we don't know. Uh, yeah, we don't know in that timeline what Logan was up to between the reset at, in Days of Future Past and uh, Logan, which would have been the next time that we see him. I believe we haven't seen anything in that time Like period, That one, I it... think, even is considered an alternate timeline as well. And yeah. so I think Logan is kind of a standalone, which is why I never really bought the, uh, the, the few people who are saying like, Oh, it ended so perfectly. Don't bring him back just for this. Like this is, this is going to ruin that legacy. Like it doesn't ruin anything. That movie still happened. It's still one of the best superhero movies ever made. Um, mm -hmm. I, I kind of don't include it as part of the X-Men saga because I think of it, uh, 
um, because I think of it so separately. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's, I feel like he's going to pluck them out. They're going to use that little device they got from Cable. They're going to go hopping around a bunch of different timelines. Um, I've, I've been thinking about it. I don't know what the conflict could be. I don't know what the driving force of them doing this could be. But I think at the end of it, uh, Logan goes back to his timeline and Deadpool ends up in the MCU um, at the end of the movie for to get it's his sliding into the MCU. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know that all. I just, I just need, I just need that movie now. I love it. Garrett, what do you think about the theories placed on the board? And do you have, uh, one of your own that you'd just like to see take place in this movie? Uh, yeah, TJ, I love watching your head swell up live as I inflate your ego. So I <laughs> love your theories. They're incredible. This one knocked it out of the park as usual for me um rob you're right up there as well it's hard to differentiate the oh, two yeah. and uh i'll put one on the board for myself as well just not to be lame not to you know be a party pooper and join you guys so you know you guys have already said some really awesome things it's kind of hard to compete with that but i think if there's anything that could compete with that it would be a Wolverine versus Hulk fight. Uh, and then obviously it's a Deadpool movie, so you got to have him in there. And I think Deadpool would be a hilarious pairing with someone that we're about to talk about, She-Hulk. Uh, so I think the four of them in a movie could be fucking hilarious. Uh, and also, you know, who, what true superhero comic Marvel fan doesn't want to see a live action Wolverine versus Hulk, like maybe not Professor Hulk, but like Hulk, Hulk, Hulked out, uh, smash, smash Hulk fight. So that's, that's, that's my theory on the board. I like it. I absolutely love it. I am here for it. I would love to see it. And I'm going to throw out a bunch of theories on the board for our next piece of news right off the bat. Cause like we mentioned, we got a lot to talk about still. So, Armor Wars is now being developed as a feature film as opposed to a series on Disney+. Plus. This is huge. I know there's a lot of people over at Streamer, Rob, who are huge fans of Armor Wars <laughs> and the potential oh, that it Brit? could bring. Uh, so, yeah, Brit, oh our friend Britt Crowley. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, Britt uh, <laughs> Brit, uh, is a huge fan. And so um, I'm curious what she thinks of this as well. But I'm going to throw a bunch of different scenarios on the board for everyone and i want to know what you think of them because if this is going to be now be a movie there has to be a thing there has to be a reason like something big is going to happen and so the most obvious to me is something's going to happen in wakanda forever maybe it's vibranium related but it's going to cause some serious we know wakanda is out in the light now it's going to cause some serious tension in the world over everyone wanting a piece of vibranium and so maybe after riri becomes ironheart this sparks a little bit of uh worldwide tension into an armor war um if we get some potential other big bads that end up showing up in uh in wakanda forever then maybe they could play a part in that as well another one is we talked about earlier kevin feige wanting the scarlet wish to return well we don't know where the great, the most uh, powerful sentient, wep sentient weapon ever created, according to Sword, is right now. The Vision, White Vision. We have no idea where the hell he is. And so maybe Vision plays a big role, and maybe this could actually be the place that we see um, the Scarlet Witch next. Um, and uh, something totally off the board that uh, people aren't expecting at all. What do you guys uh, think of that one? What do you think of the news in general? Rob, I'll throw it to you first. Um, Armor Wars moving from a show to a movie. Um, the, the biggest question I have in my mind is, I, I, I saw it somewhere, but I believe Secret Invasion was going to tie somewhat into Armor Wars uh, before, at least a while ago. They had talked about that. I, don't I think know I had heard that as well. I don't know if that's the case anymore. Um, we'll have to wait and see. But Armor Wars becoming a movie, and, and I agree with you, that 
there's something big that's going to happen that we don't know about for it to be moved from show to a movie for many, many, uh, many, many more bucks to make off of this. So if, if they're going to be moving it to a movie, that marketing is going to be heavy. Um, so something's going to happen. They're going to have to I be got, teasing something. And I got two more uh, theories that I want to throw uh, your way, Garrett, before um, I get your take on this news. And I'm, I have a kind of already lost one of them. So I'll focus on the one first because this one's my favorite. And that's, oh, yeah, no, I remember the first one. Uh, Happy still needs a really good lawyer. We haven't seen him show up in She-Hulk. Maybe that'll be why we see Matt, uh, is he'll be with Happy. Who knows? But um, Happy's still going to need a really good lawyer at some point. So maybe we get Matt Murdock in Armor Wars. Maybe we get uh, Jennifer Walters in Armor Wars. Two big players that could spice up marketing and uh, get people into the theaters. And my favorite theory, the most far-fetched of theories, we don't know when our pal Spidey's coming back into the MCU yet. Now, there's a character from comics, from cartoons, that has donned the mantle from the Iron Man 3 movie of Iron Patriot, and that's Norman Osborn. If, what if we get a new Norman Osborn into the MCU wearing the Iron Patriot uniform, suit, whatever you want to call it, and Spider-Man has to come in because he's the only one that knows, hey... We shouldn't trust this Norman Osborn character, I know, for multiversal reasons, so he swings in and helps at some point. And we have Norman Osborn being introduced to the MCU, a little Spidey cameo uh, headlined with a uh, Don Cheadle's War Machine and uh, Riri Williams as the leads. What do you think, Garrett? There's an added extra layer of, like, fucked upness to that, too, in that in the MCU, like, Tony... Iron Man is his like mentor person. So and to, like, no one will remember that. Yeah. To flip that back is uh something there's something pretty beautiful about that. I, I like that a lot. Um once again, you your theories have gotten my mind juices flowing. Um yeah, Rob, I like, go ahead. I really, I really I really like the Iron Patriot Norman Osborne part. Because do you guys know what team Norman Osborn helped lead for a period of time as Iron Patriot? Is it the Thunderbolts? Thunderbolts. The Thunderbolts, yes. Mm. So we never know. Wow. wow. And yeah. I haven't met all these characters in the Thunderbolts yet. Kevin Feige told yeah. us that. Imagine we're all like uh, Harrison Ford uh, recast as uh, General Ross and they're like <laughs> Norman Osborning <laughs> him on the side. And we have no idea. That'd uh, be pretty um, wild. Um, but no, I do think, uh, Rob, what you say about the budget is kind of where my mind went immediately when I heard this news. Um, is that not only is it going to obviously have like a bigger marketing budget, but it'll have a bigger overall budget. Um, so yeah, some something wild is going to happen. I love Don Cheadle, so I'm excited to see, you know, probably six episodes would be more runtime so i'd get more don Cheadle, but i think mm-hmm. uh a two-hour armor wars movie will be enough i think that'll mm-hmm. do it because i think i think a you know six episode series like they've been doing I, I don't think enough people will be invested in that obviously we would but the casual viewer you know mm-hmm. another uh piece of news that you just reminded me of garrett that i forgot to put on the rundown was uh we did get the runtime for black panther wakanda forever and it's looking at two over two hours and 40 wow. minutes. We are back to the long Marvel movies that uh, slightly for multiverse of madness, but even more so for love and thunder. That was one of my biggest complaints is we just needed a little more of it. There are parts that were choppy and we could have used a little more of. So I'm happy that Wakanda forever is not getting that treatment and we are getting the full length thing because the long movies that that's never, uh, that's never bothered me. I, I don't mind uh, diving into a full length movie. It's just more stuff that I enjoy. But let's talk about She-Hulk because we got two shows that we got to talk about still and we've been here for almost a half hour. So diving into She-Hulk, we had a fun character driven episode. Um, what I tweeted out uh, after the after I watched this episode is I kind of feel like this is the first Disney Plus show I almost would have rather to be able to binge or to be able to watch two episodes at a time or two episodes at a week or have 
friggin' 20 episodes of it because it's a sitcom and I'm not used to <laughs> only getting 20 minutes of, uh, of, of content once per week because either uh, most sitcoms I watch, there's five seasons out already and I get to go all the way through or they're releasing a couple episodes at the time. And maybe this is a me thing because like I'm watching Reboot on Hulu right now and I love it. Um, but I'm getting one 20 minute episode a week and I'm like, damn, like I need more. Um, so what do you, uh, to think of this before we dive into the episode, which I feel like 20 minutes a week when we're getting these great character driven character growth stuff, it's awesome. But when there's only two more 30 minute periods of that after this, it's like, well, damn, I just want a little bit more Garrett. What do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to get you to shut up because you're taking all my thoughts right out of my mouth. Um, I was talking to our friend Mo today, and that's pretty much exactly what I said. I love the show. It is so freaking fun. But knowing that there's like two episodes left kind of freaks me out and that they're going to be like most likely 20, maybe 25 minutes. I This show needs 25 episodes. Let us have fun for a couple months for just 20 minutes, you know, a night a week um that's exactly what we need for this it needs to be it, it needed to be a sitcom style we needed to get the daredevil like elongated 18 uh however long you want to call it but uh th that is definitely what this needed and we could have really enjoyed more of these character driven episodes because we'll know like we have 13 other episodes we'll get to something good when that time comes, but when you market the show, even with a little bit of daredevil, like fans are just going to be waiting for daredevil. Like that, is, that just, it doesn't bother me personally, but that's just, you know, that's how it's going to go down when you market it like that. So now that we're at this point where we're like, okay, is abomination going to do something? Cause we're probably going to be seeing him in thunderbolts, but he's still just a nice dude who's just running this wellness place. Um, now we will get to a lot more of the abomination stuff after, but um, Rob, I'm interested in what you think of this. And I do think it's funny that so many people expected this to almost be the she Hulk and daredevil show where um, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of of the mindset with you, Garrett, it doesn't bother me. And I think like he was in a, in a two and a half minute long trailer, he was in it for seven seconds. And so to get him in two of nine episodes, that's actually a pretty good ratio can, uh, considering what we got of him in the trailer. Um, but I think it's funny as well that we kind of thought, uh, or some thought this might be the daredevil and she Hulk show when in reality, when we're getting a lot of daredevil, uh, born again, that might be a borderline season two of she Hulk in a mini, uh, in a mini portion of the daredevil storyline. What do you think of the format, Rob? Uh, I like it because I under this is the first Disney Plus show, like Marvel at least Disney Plus show that understands that it is a TV show, um, and I, I I really like the fact that they've been doing that. But I do agree. Um, I feel like if they would have interjected a little bit more plot here and plot here, I maybe wouldn't feel so bad about it. Um, but in this last episode with only two more episodes to go, we only really got the very end of the episode to push it, to push it forward, which I'm not wrong about. Cause every she like her going to the group therapy really was good for her and helped for character development. But for the main plot, we got two more episodes. So next week we assume has to be a daredevil. And if the daredevil episode doesn't involve the main plot somehow i'm really worried for how the finale is going to turn out because if her and daredevil's little side mission that they have to do doesn't involve something with the main bad guys i'm i don't know what i'm going to think of the finale if they try and wrap it all up in that one episode there's a crossover uh episodes uh set in spider-man the a animated series that i love and it's when Peter Parker is being framed, and so Matt Murdock is his lawyer. And then at nighttime, uh, Spider Man and Daredevil are off fighting crime, trying to clear Peter Parker's name together. And I, I really TV. hope that, yeah, right. It's just like, <laughs> oh, it's such a classic arc. And yeah. that's kind of what I hope we get out of this last two episodes: is Jen and Matt meeting in court, 
and then having Daredevil and She-Hulk having to solve something together uh, alternatively outside of that. And uh, what I do appreciate about this series, and I agree with you, Rob, it is the best like episodic sequence they've done in an episode. Mm-hmm. But even if it's not more episodes, longer ones, because mm-hmm. we just to give us a little bit more court stuff. In this episode, it was great. Such awesome character development. But even if we weren't getting that extra plot stuff, give us some more Pug and Nikki. Why do we yeah. have to go so long without seeing Pug and Nikki? We love Pug and Nikki. They're great mm-hmm. additions to the show. Um, what's Titania up to after getting her ass kicked? Like just snippets to make it a little longer, give us a little bit, give us a little bit more. But what this show is accomplishing, and I think will definitely accomplish by the end, and was the goal. Um, is the same as most of these other Disney Plus shows. Now, there are some um, there are some exceptions. Moon Knight had been Moon Knight for a while. Uh, we just had to learn about him. Loki, we've known Loki for a long time, and it was setting Phase 4, Phase 5, and Phase 6 up and the future. But WandaVision. At the beginning of WandaVision, Wanda Maximoff was Wanda Maximoff, and by the end, Wanda Maximoff was the Scarlet Witch. At the beginning of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Sam Wilson was Falcon, and by the end, he was Captain America. At the beginning of this show, at the the beginning of Ms. Marvel, she was Kamala Khan, and by the end, she was Ms. Marvel. At the beginning of this show, Jennifer Walters, even though she still had powers at the beginning, was just Jennifer Walters with some powers. And by the end, she is going to be She-Hulk, attorney at law. Um, And so I think that is kind of the main goal, and they're going to reach it, is... They're setting the stage for, in the debut season of the first Disney Plus show that she's in, she is now able to show up wherever, and we know who She-Hulk is, and she is fully capable of joining whatever team or mission she needs to take part in. Uh, Garrett, what do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. I think we see in Hawkeye, Kate Bishop kind of is able to take on Kingpin at the end. Um, So we have this theme of, you know, becoming that hero version of yourself in the end. And I do think that we're going to see that we spend, we get a breakthrough in this episode, right? With her personally, Mm -hmm. um, when she's in the therapy group and she decides to, you know, be, be love Jen and hang out with Jen and uh, let these other people, have the chance to love Jen as well. And so um, that sets, that opens the door for her to love She-Hulk and for her to, you know, flow seamlessly between both sides of herself. And I, I, you know. Sorry, I was just going to say, and so like if the goal of the plot really is for Jen to become She-Hulk and for her to be comfortable and confident in herself as She-Hulk, this episode, in that sense, really advanced that part of the plot more than any of the others have yet. And there's really a, now one last thing that's going to make her the final piece of She-Hulk, and that's going to be, like, putting the costume on, I assume. Yeah, putting and the costume some on ass and kicking it. some ass. Yeah. Nah. And hopefully we get there, finally, because there's been, you know... We got we got a little bit of her, you know throwing man bowl away from her car and tossing the wrecker guy into the nicely stacked chairs uh, that man bowl had stacked. And that's fun. We love that. We get a little bit of, you know, her fighting Titania at the, at the wedding, but uh, we want to see a little bit more. We we're do. ready for and it, so right? We're ready for it. We're absolutely ready for it. And something we got a taste of last episode was, too good to be true, Josh. And Josh, of course, is actually Hulk King, and we're all team fuck Josh. And, you know, him and Intelligentsia, they've been up to no good. I'm interested, Rob, to know before we kind of circle back to uh, the Emil Blonsky support group, Obama Stay, um, I, w- I want to know if you uh, had some ill will, some worries about uh, Josh after last episode. Yeah. Um, so when we first met Josh, the first conversation, I was in a group watch with Mo and I, and I texted him as soon as they started talking, I don't trust this guy. I do not trust this guy whatsoever. Saw it coming a mile away, broke my heart to see it anyway, when they finally revealed it. But they like my, my jaw kind of dropped because of the way that he's going to get at her. 
with taking that picture and everything, like I was like, oh my god, like they're doing that in like a Marvel show. Like that's not, that's really not okay. And I'm like, I'm really, really upset and and sad about this. And I'm, <sighs> I want to see She Hulk. Rob, I am also team She-Hulk find love. And I was also, it was like so obvious that it was like, please let this be like not too obvious that like, let her just find a little bit of happiness so that she can reconcile the other part of herself. You know, someone Mm -hmm. can like her for this and for that individually, uh, not apart from themselves. And damn it, Josh, you had to, you had to, first of all, if I woke up and I'm her and he's just like, not there yeah she didn't question that i was so the confused fuck, dude yeah the fuck like <laughs> dog did you lock my door what if someone like we're in la what if someone comes and just like opens my apartment door and just come oh, well, obviously i can defend myself because i'm she hulk but still that's not the the, that's the point the principle <laughs> the fuck. principle exactly that's what i was just gonna say too um i mean the one thing i will say that's a positive is you know who could appreciate jen for who she is as the she hulk and as jennifer walters would be matt murdoch yeah so maybe this uh sets the stage for a little fling between the two of them but uh we knew josh might be a little bit too good to be true uh we talked about this last week we hoped it wouldn't be the case but we thought it would be Something else that I'm wondering if might be too good to be true is Emil Blonsky as the abomination. So two scenarios, because I think it could also maybe be a red herring. Now, with the Wrecker being part of this crew, yes, maybe he has turned over a new leaf and he's just... Yeah, I wasn't buying it. Quick, quick uh, touch. Man Bull, obviously cool. El Aguila, that's another random mutant mm-hmm. that they've yeah. thrown uh, thrown into the MCU now. Um, and then uh, Saracen, Saracen, the guy who thinks he's a vampire, has appeared in three Blade comics throughout canon. So uh, maybe a Supposedly little Supposedly the first vampire, there. I think, right? Um, I'm not that's sure. I, maybe his dad? Like, maybe that's, that's who his I dad heard. was maybe the yeah. first uh, vampire. I don't know. Saracen was my favorite, though. At. And so, yeah, he was a lot of fun. And they, all, they had all the little blood teases um, yeah. with, uh, with Wrecker there as well. And that's another red flag with Emil, I think, is Electric Fence. Mm-hmm. Then we also see a bioelectric sword from El Agula. So maybe he was just trying to slice that little anklet off for him. And that's, uh, and that's why it malfunctioned. So um, that's a couple red flags, I think, for Emil. But I'm going to throw two scenarios at both of you. And that's one whether it's the leader or Val or just intelligentsia people or Kingpin, whoever is in charge of this uh, search for Jen's blood. Um, Emil's part of it. He is doing some really, really strong acting right now. That's why he's got record there. They were holding Jen, trying to learn more about her, trying to stall uh, while they can... uh, get all this work done with her blood and no don't check text josh delete josh's number so that you can't track him um, that was the red flag like for me and so for me that's oh is is a meal is a meal part of this he's part of this crew scenario number two is maybe that's a red herring maybe a meal isn't too good to be true and he is just getting duped a little bit and wrecker is just realized oh the abomination is out he's he's a bit of a hulk maybe i'll go over there and see if i can learn any secrets about jen walters and he well it's public knowledge that she was his lawyer exactly exactly and so he's just going to do some recon then bang she shows up uh he's part of the whole intelligentsia gang and so he was just doing some uh good acting while he was there i think those are two possibilities and maybe emil just had nothing to do with it and uh that's uh trying to throw us off and uh but the wrecker thing was he wasn't actually fully uh rehabbed we'll uh we'll say Gary, I, I think if there's one thing that this show has consistently hammered home at least one time if not multiple times in every episode is that the guys in the show besides bruce has been like and, and her dad every oh, other guy and Wong. Uh, But every other guy has been not to be trusted and been proven to be, you know, have some other kind of agenda or 
something. So uh, that doesn't bode well for the gang and not that type of gang. <laughs> nice, nice poll. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the way they've kind of victimized the meal through this light makes me want to think that maybe he won't be part of that. And like, he's somebody that has worked to be rehabilitated. And if you work on yourself, you can turn into not being an asshole. And so I, I think I'd, I'd kind of enjoy it if they wanted to go about that. But Rob, what do you, what do you think? What's your, what's your thoughts uh, on this? Uh, I want to lean towards, he's actually just cool now. I would like to lean towards that. But we also know from the trailer that we do see him hulked out at least one more time as Abomination, which means he takes the inhibitor off again, which is very suspicious. So I don't know. I really don't know which way I would lean. I, I, w I would like to see him be good. But at the end of the day, he is still... The last time that we'd seen him before this, he was kind of whacked out and crazy with the with the serum inside of him that they gave him, which didn't help his men his mental stability. So I don't I don't know. I, I really, really don't know. I I really want him to be good as well because I think that he's obviously gonna be showing up in the Thunderbolts, and I think that that makes his arc in that movie a shit ton more interesting if he's actually working hard to stay out of trouble and rehabilitate people and then he's going to be somehow forced or blackmailed you know into this scenario of having to or however it works out we don't know how it's going to work out but he's going to have to that's going to put him on a conflicting path moving forward of having to work with all these gray area people I mean, if it's Bucky and it's Yelena, I, I feel like um, maybe he just will be like, we need a Hulk and Red Hulk's not here. So Abomination is going to be that on this hero team. Like, who really knows uh, how it's going to play out uh, with that one? But I don't know, guys. Is it time to talk some Andor? We've gone through She-Hulk. Uh, we got two more episodes of it we're very excited for. But Rob, when we invited you on this podcast... It was to talk Andor. That was the main reason we did it initially. So, Rob, I want to know what you think of the series as a whole so far, then your brief thoughts on episode four, and then we're going to take it through a bit of a different format than we usually do. Garrett, you just finished this episode. So after we get Rob's thoughts on uh, on the, the series as a whole, Garrett, I want you to take me through kind of your thought process as you were watching, your enjoyment, your whether it's a, a theory, a, something you noticed, something you enjoyed, something you disliked. Take me through kind of your whole watch uh, that just happened, and then uh, we'll get mine and Rob's uh, takes on it after that. Love that. So, Rob, what do you think of the series as a whole so far, and then in particular, episode four? Yeah, so as a whole... I really didn't think I could like a Star Wars show, show more than uh, The Mandalorian. Live action Star Wars show, at least. More than The Mandalorian. And uh, they did it for bless, me. Bless, bless. Shout out with, Clone Wars, shout out Rebels. Yes, I had to do that because those are in a different echelon than, than those. Um, but I do. Through four episodes, I am liking it more than the mandalorian and don't get me wrong the mandalorian is amazing it's a great space western it's great star wars but this is a political spy thriller set in a star wars universe that is more character driven and dialogue driven than action and 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 the amazing visuals that we get from star wars movies it's not that's not the focus of this one it's not as much of a spectacle as it is a sit down listen and enjoy the plot um though i'm sure I, there will be some amazing moments oh oh yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. but just from and there have been so already far, yeah. yeah agreed and that's like, actually something that i've been enjoying that's quite a bit different than the other star wars shows um is when we talked about this a little bit earlier the way they've done the flashbacks to his childhood i thought was really really strong but also it's the dialogue driven uh nature that you mentioned is something i've always struggled with with the these star wars shows is kind of what we talked about back to She-Hulk, is if you're giving me 30 minutes a week, I don't want 
two straight minutes of no one talking and you only showing me scenery. I get the scenery is cool and I get that you put a lot of money into it, but I don't need these long periods of walking. I think that's the one of the reasons why I didn't get don't that. say it sorry sorry don't I say it, say it. don't say you it. dare bring up lord of the rings right now <laughs> well cut me i knew off right there. where that was going <laughs> continue your thought rob uh yeah so yeah as a whole absolutely love it this it uh like some parts left me speechless especially in episode three like at, like i so totally weird i just had to compare it to it watching uncut gems right for me personally, if I watch Uncut Gems, my heart is going the entire time. It's an anxiety movie. All of episode three was like that with the music and just the, the, the moments of silence they would give you to let things simmer and let the tensions rise. Oh, my gosh. But episode four really, really dug it. We got Coruscant during The Empire which we haven't gotten that other than the end of episode three, which that was like right at the beginning. Like we got Coruscant during the empire, which I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And uh, this, I was just telling Mo earlier today, this is one of my favorite, like couple year gaps in star Wars. The show is exploring the beginnings of the rebels, the rebel Alliance, where they're all different sects across the galaxy who can't communicate very well to each other. And this is before that. And it's nice to see the little, the little sprouts of the rebel Alliance starting to spring up before what we know them in the original trilogy. They're just little groups and with all individual stories. Before. And a lot of them don't even like each other too. At some yeah. Point. yeah. So they're fighting amongst themselves and that uh, I, it, it's amazing so, points, Rob. I love how you're bringing this stuff up. It's yeah. one of my favorite like just areas to look at in star Wars. Cause then you look forward to rebels and you see Ahsoka who helped connect all the little sex as fulcrum communicating between them to help bring the rebel Alliance to form. And just episode three, when uh, Luthen said, don't you want to fight these bastards for real? Oh my God. I wanted to scream. Yes. Yeah. No, all right. I'm, done, I'm done. Geek it out. Don't geek it out. No, I love Don't it. Keep, continue, yeah, continue that Keep throughout out. the episode. We got that Mon is Mothma. We got amazing the, commentary. What the, yes. So what? The, what uh, I was gonna say to your point. Yeah, truly amazing commentary. Geek out as much as you want, man. Don't stop. Um, but uh, I was when people like us who are well versed in the animated shows, who that's some of our favorite Star Wars content mm -hmm. ever created, especially Rebels, more so than Clone Wars, especially yes. Rebels. We are used to this type of interaction that Cassian has with this new crew. Like at no point was I sitting there being like, Oh no, they're not going to work this out. Like this is classic rebels. We got mm -hmm. a makeshift crew that has to get a job done. They're getting it together. Everyone has their specialities. The plan doesn't go according to plan, but because of all their talents, they make it work. They pull it through in the end. And this is classic rebels. Um, and while I hope that we get some some teases, some uh, some maybe appearances or mentions from some of our favorite rebels, because this is happening at the same time frame, mm -hmm. um, like my God, could you ever imagine if we got a sneaky Caden uh, uh, Jarrus in live action that no one was expecting? <sighs> Um, I mean, they up. they already brought up Ryloth, so I'm yeah. I'd love to see I you know I, I like that I'd one. love to see Hera. I'd love to see Hera Syndulla. Oh, I be I mean, we know it's coming in uh, Ahsoka. That's why Ahsoka, Ahsoka is my most uh, anticipated show. It's I think Rebel ever sequel, to hit yeah. Disney Plus, like yeah. um, just live including Marvel. Rebels. And I'm I'm I enjoy Marvel over Star Wars ten times out of ten. Usually, me personally. Mm -hmm. Man, I don't think there's a Marvel show I've ever been ex as excited for as I am for Ahsoka. Garrett, yeah. you just watched this episode. What'd you think? Well, first of all, I was not there last week when you guys chatted the first three episodes. So I will also give a brief rundown of my thoughts. Because going into this, I was not, up until the first trailers came out, I was not really that jazzed about this show. Um like you, TJ, Rebels is my favorite Star Wars content out of all of the content. But uh, Rogue One is very high on my list of live action. I know it's kind of one of those where you love it or you hate it. I love it. However, Cassian and Andor it, was... Wrong. 
Yeah, agreed. Um, <laughs> Cassie and Andor was my least favorite f- favorite part of that movie. Um, and so I was just not that excited to deep dive into his character. And then the trailer started coming up and I was like, oh shit, this actually might bang. The first two episodes, while ha- they both had some amazing parts in it, didn't fully hook me. So I'm glad that they released it as a three episode premiere and then the fourth um because the third really is what draws you in the third is a is a fucking masterpiece it's a great episode um and let me get to my thoughts on the fourth episode i'll just read through some of my notes um the um, space I'm, I'm with you on the third episode i honestly think that like that was one of the best episodes of star wars tv that we've seen that mm-hmm. doesn't rely on something big star warsy happening you know what i mean like, the, the scene where him and luthan and or and luthan are stuck in that like warehouse and they're getting sieged and there's all those like things hung on chains and they shoot them and they all come in like that was the most fucking practical scene i've ever seen in star wars i was telling my girlfriend like if i was watching like csi and they were like in a shootout in a warehouse and like some of that shit happened like i would totally buy it and then to see that in a Star Wars show and just to be totally bought into it is incredible how they pulled it off. Um, episode four. Uh, um, yes, episode four notes. But before that, Stellan Skarsgård is absolutely carrying the series for oh me. Like gosh. he is enthralling in every scene that he's in. His um, fake smile practicing before yes. the chorus when he puts the, the way he swaps his dialogues he he's mm-hmm. absolutely crushing it when he puts the wig on does his little dance and then all of a sudden he just like walks out and he's like all right into character um it's incredible when he's in the shop with mon mothma and they're having their like coded dialogue and then you know he's like oh my assistant will keep the driver happy and then they go into the back room and then it immediately like intensifies and then they smoothly walk back out and then the conversation gets coded again it was it's fucking brilliant um and then another part of that scene she pulls up in the sickest spacecraft i've ever seen in my life um so the set design and like the costume the fits the fits are fucking unreal i beg you guys to go back and pay attention to the fits in the third and fourth episodes and even the first two episodes like this show is doing an incredible job that's this style i want it to become the style in like 20 years on earth because it's so cool mon mothma's like jacket and the chain and luthan's like robe and the purple it's it's everything and vel they're like mountain like alpaca looking shit it's everything is just perfect i love it so much um the stuff you said about Andor and the and the group and how, you know, a lot of people could, like, how is this going to play out? Classic Rebels, exactly Rebels. And I love how, I love how that one dude is, like, they're all worried about it. And I think his name's, like, Namiki or something. And he's, like, he essentially says, like, I actually am feeling his vibes. Like, he's got the right <laughs> vibes. He's going to fit in. I loved that scene. Um, and I think that this is Rebels was before the forefront into taking a look at like the daily life of someone in the star Wars universe and also the political side of things, learning stuff um, through the ISB and uh, with what's his name, the guy that turns around, he's a bad guy and then he's a good guy. Oh my uh, God. I, yeah. I know you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing stuff through like his storylines. I, that's some of the best star Wars to me and this doing it in live action is are you one talking about like the second Fulcrum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about, but I he's an ISB officer, to... and he, yeah, 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 he becomes good in the end. Um, those story, like that's what we're doing with uh, Deidre. That's like essentially what we're seeing there. Like she's she's like, hey, I'm uncovering these plans. Like they're, they're I'm seeing these patterns. They're stealing the same things. They're rising up in the same sectors. Like, and we obviously know what's going to come of that. And then the ISB guys like, uh. Eh, we're not really worried about that right now. So I love being able to seeing that stuff in animation was beautiful. And my heart is thrilled to finally be able to see that in live action and they're crushing it. So before I'm a believer. we get to the next part. Yeah. I'm in the part we, before we get to the next part of your notes, I want to get Rob's take on this too, because this is one of the few uh, really parts of this episode that I really 
pinpoint it is it's like you mentioned rob it's the it's the start of the rebellion occurring and i think it's very interesting that we also get to see the ineptitudes within the empire outside of just stormtroopers not being able to aim but there's people exactly like you said garrett waving these red flags of things that are happening and it's just being pushed down and something like we saw in episode three when it attempts to get handled without support it fails miserably um and it's kind of from the top down disorganized due to a little bit too much uh compartmentalization it's similar to uh shield and hydra's infiltration of it but in reverse with the rebellion infiltrating it and to emphasize how like what you guys were saying how like plot heavy this is or not necessarily plot heavy but how it doesn't depend on these giant action set pieces but the thrilling like dialogue is enough um that that really speaks to that that you know um i totally lost my train of thought i'm sorry no you're all good rob what do you think about getting to see the rebellion at the beginning not just from the rebel side but the empire side and kind of what leads to it happening uh my out of, out of all these episodes uh my my favorite parts has definitely it's the little tiny things that they flesh out um two examples i can think of right or three one thing that we've seen a little bit of but it hasn't been fleshed out too much was and it's not involved in this show but the clone troopers phasing out and the stormtroopers phasing in right mm -hmm. little things like that especially when it comes to the corpo sectors of the galaxy which andor really has started to dive into which haven't really been explored before in most mainstream star wars was corpo sectors at the beginning of the empire before the empire just said screw it we're taking your guys power away you don't even work for us anymore we're just going to control everything um i'm really really liking uh fleshing out that era where there was some there were some places um still under control uh by by corpos which again is just a sect of the empire but it wasn't the full-on stormtroopers boots on the ground 24 7 but my my favorite part so far of seeing the beginning of the rebellion has been seeing the tiny bits of how everything was possible the whole reason mom mothma talked to luthan that luthan wanted to talk was about money they need money like we you see in the original trilogy with the rebellion they're all formed and they've got all their gear and they've got everything they've needed but no one ever really questioned it these things cost money they're, they're buying these things. They're buying these things in bulk from black market, wherever they can get it, stealing it. And it's nice to see that Mon Mothma, among others, I bet, that we don't know about, is that there's actually influential rich people in the Star Wars galaxy that do actually support the rebellion and aren't terribly crappy people. And they're able Not to only rich people, but people that are involved in yeah. setting the policy and mm -hmm. going to the Senate meetings and, yes. you know, sitting in those cool bubble chairs and whatnot. Um, yeah. But yeah, and the that's an amazing uh, point, Rob. Bail Organa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's nice to see more and more starting to pop up out of the word works to see, oh, so this is how the rebellion was, got all their stuff. This is how. They were able to get, you know, the the gear to fight back against the empires because there is people in secret across the galaxy helping fund them, and it, it's nice to see those little tiny details that you would never think about because it's fun space fighting. Sometimes, you know, it's it, it's really really cool. Yeah, I'm there's a reason we got to this you. place. We, there's a reason why, yeah. And uh, I'm just I'm it's it's been so fun geeking out about this and. I just like it brought me back to just a couple weeks ago at the Edmonton Expo getting to tell Ashley Eckstein how much I adored oh, the uh, oh. season finale <laughs> of uh, um, the season finale of uh, season two of Rebels. Um, it's just yeah, Ahsoka okay. and Vader. It's I'm, it's I'm, my favorite I'm, stuff I'm... in in all of Star Wars and her 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 uh, panel. Her panel was titled. I am no Jedi. And uh, it was just her talking about her adoration of Star Wars, her adoration of Star Wars fans and Disney. It was just, <laughs> it was so, it was so incredible. And I, I love her so much. She's amazing. Um, I'm so excited for Tales of the Jedi. Oh, okay. oh my goodness. Listen, I'm so excited for Tales of the Jedi. Real quick. I am, I, I've tweeted about it before. I, I wear it on my chest. I am 
the biggest Ahsoka fan in the world and have been since I was seven years old and saw the Clone Wars movie in theaters. She's the best character in Star Wars. Everybody can fight me. Okay? Everybody can fight me. She is. She is. We won't. She's the the best best character character in Star Wars. Easily the best character in Star Wars. And we're living in the golden era of Ahsoka content. And I'm so happy. Ahsoka embodies what Luke was supposed to embody. Yeah. Yeah. Ahsoka is the rebel against the Empire. Ahsoka Mm -hmm. is the one that sees institutional oppression and goes, I don't care what side I'm on. Fuck that. And yeah. does what she believes is right and what she, what her morals is. I yeah, she is. Ahsoka oh, is I want to go rebel against, against something right now. <laughs> Damn it! No, I'm feeling hype. <laughs> let's uh, let's go overthrow I, uh, a regime right now, boys. Please. <laughs> I'm marking that as a clip uh, for Ruben for later, so that we can tag <laughs> Ashley Eckstein and Rosario Dawson in that and and post it on socials. But we've been here over an hour already, Garrett. Give me the rest of your notes, your final thoughts on uh, episode four, and then uh, Rob will get your final thoughts as well, and then I'll uh, I'll carry us out of here. Yeah, I tried to I tried to rip them out pretty quickly because uh, I didn't want to waste your time, but I have a couple more, so I'll I'll say it. Um, I'm gonna butcher his name, and I I'm so I so apologize for this, but um, e- Eben Moss Bachrock. Back rack. I don't know. The guy who plays Micro and Punisher. I love him. He's so amazing. Uh, so glad to see him in the show. He shines. Um, the suicide run, which I assume is going to be next episode, that they their plan with the you know the one hole or the the stars exploding in the background, and then like the nine minute run up the hill. Like them describing it was giving me. It was getting me so hyped for like the episode, so I can't even imagine like watching it. Like I know we talk about how dialogue driven the show is and how we all love that, but I am very excited for this particular action sequence that I'm dubbing the Suicide Run. I think it's going to be a banger. Um, and then my last point, which I kind of touched on earlier, is just that the Empire does not deserve Dedra Miro. Um, I think that she is just a hell of an ISB officer, and hopefully she sees that she's not on the right side and eventually becomes a pretty good asset for the rebel alliance that's kind of my hope we hope she sees the light side of the force if you will and uh rob tell me what your uh, final thoughts on episode four were and uh anything you're hoping for to see in the rest of this series uh now episode four i um I I really touched on a majority of the stuff because my my main love has just been this era of the beginning of the rebellion. Um, But uh, going forward in this series, um, I want to make a a little bit of a comment for the people who think that – you'll know what I'm talking about here. The people who think that prequel media is bad, right? Okay, listen. Beautiful. Beautiful. Prequel media, if done correctly, like Andor is – can be amazing Mm. it it doesn't matter that we know that andor ends up dying as a martyr for the rebellion we're not worried about the stakes for andor because we know what happens i saw this on tiktok and i completely agree and it helped it it helped me word this we're the stakes are for everybody around him we don't know who makes it out of this show and it's gonna suck because not everybody's going to make it out um and and that's what that's what I really love about this show is just it, it brings in all these new characters that we're gonna fall in love with, and I think in my I'm mind a lot we were uh, yeah, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I think a lot of them will be struck down. I honestly do by the Empire, which will make this the show which has made the Empire look scarier than ever without even showing a single stormtrooper. I, I think it's really gonna go into like season two, which then leads right into Rogue One with just like this. I don't know. I, I just, I love the way the Empire feels in the show. It's just this overhanging, watchful eye, I feel like, in the sky that's just looming over everybody who wants to fight back against them. And it's terrible. Sauron, if you will. Yeah, literally. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's without scary, the walking. And I love it. 
Yeah. <laughs> Sauron, but with a flying eagle. And uh, the other thing I really enjoyed, and this is something that you mentioned, Garrett, was uh, with the suicide run, is how kind of opposed to it at, like Cassian is at the start, right? Like, he's like, this is a crazy idea. This is a stupid plan. You guys can't be doing this. And then by Rogue One, when he's doing all kinds of suicide runs, we just kind of see him as a vet. So I do like that we're kind of seeing what leads into that. Whew. This has been a lot to talk about, and we're going to only have more next week. Garrett's got one more point, And then, Rob, one. I want you to tell me when uh, where the people can find you on socials. Yeah, one last point is that uh, we were talking about how we wished She-Hulk could be, you know, 20 episodes of 20, 20 minute episodes so we could just have more fun for a longer time um, and or at 12 episodes, you know, at four episodes in, it already feels like we're at a pretty breakneck pace um, and it feels like, oh, if this were a six episode show and we're halfway through it like we're already way farther than we would be in a Marvel show. It feels like. Mm. Um, so the fact that we have like eight more episodes, pretty exciting. I love that. And I'm excited to be talking about it for a lot more weeks. I'm with you, Rob, where can the people find you on socials? And do you have any articles, reviews, things like that out uh, that the people should check out? Uh, yeah, you can find me. Uh, my personal Twitter is at Rob Sarwine. X, you can find uh, my site streamer at streamer news on Twitter or at the streamer.com. Um, if you want to check out any of my articles, I highly recommend you go back and check out uh, my interview with X Men the Animated Series composer Ron Wasserman. Uh, he made the da -da 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 that everybody loves. Uh, so go check that out. It was a great, great interview. Uh, maybe talked a little bit about if he's coming back for X-Men 97 or not, I don't know. You have to go read it. You'll have to go read it. Um, other than that, yeah. And that's streamer, S-T-R-E-A-M-R. -E yes, you're right. I always forget to do that. And it, yeah, always. I gotta yeah, I got to remind the people listening. Uh, <laughs> no e. I, I myself struggle to find it sometimes, and I do not <laughs> want anyone listening to struggle to find it. So that's uh, the streamer.com with no E. There it is. That'll do it for this week's episode of the Agents of Fandom podcast. You can, of course, find Garrett, Real Slim Blaney on Twitter, me, TJ underscore Zwarge5, Agents of Fandom on all the socials except Twitter. It's at Agents Fandom. Make sure you subscribe, like, do all those fun things that help us out oh so much. And, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll do it for this week. We'll be back next week. We are going to be joined by uh, our friend Rachel Leishman uh, to talk She-Hulk, to talk Andor. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll be back with you next week. Check out our podcast, Ticket to Reality podcast, Agents of Fandom, Streamer News, The Streamer uh, website, all the good things. That'll do it for this week. Peace. Let's hit the yurt. Yeah.